Hi, a warm welcome to all of you to this webinar. I am David Swanepoel. I'm a professor of audiology at the University of Pretoria, and I'm also a founder of the YearX Group and a scientific advisor. So today is a historic day with the World Hearing Day um, on the 3rd of March, but especially because it's the launch of the first ever World Report on Hearing which is a very influential report that will influence hearing care into the future. Now, if you have any questions, just on a practical note, during the course of today's webinar, please feel free to leave them in the questions tab on the GoToWebinar um, control panel. Uh, there are persons who will answer questions that they're able to answer during the course of the webinar, but I will, will also leave a little bit of time towards the end for us to address some of those pressing questions. So the way I'd like to do this uh, presentation today is uh, by way of two main sections. The first is to share with you the main findings of the World Report on Hearing that was released today. Now, I've been fortunate to serve on the World Hearing Forum and I served as an advisor to the, to the report and also as a reviewer to the chapters. And uh, that'll be the first section. So I'd like to uh, share briefly what the report outlines, but feel free, please, and I'd like to encourage you to download the report for yourself. Uh, it's available online on the WHO website. It's an excellent report that really provides a host of very valuable information along the lines of hearing care and the future of hearing care around the world. Secondly, I would like to consider some digital innovations that are supporting some of the world report on hearing objectives. So we'll look at early detection of hearing loss and, and there I'll share two examples of uh, projects that we've been involved in using some of these exciting technologies. And then lastly, we'll look at an innovative new model for community-based hearing care for adults in low-income countries that I'll share with you which is an ongoing pro project that we are um, going to launch in Kenya later this year. As I start off the presentation, I always just need to make sure I acknowledge the host of different colleagues and collaborators that have been part of this work. So this is the research team, the core team that have been involved in much of the work that I'll share with you. We've been fortunate to work with colleagues from around the world in Sweden, um, in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine um, in Australia, and then also colleagues at the University of Pretoria and, and students and postgraduate students. So our institution is also now an official collaborating center for the prevention of deafness and hearing loss. And then also, as I mentioned, uh, YearX has been instrumental in the work we've done, uh, developing the technologies and providing them for these different projects and implementation studies. And then uh, also just again the disclosure that I am a co-founder and a scientific advisor to the YearX group. We've also been working with wonderful uh, NGOs and non-profit organizations in communities who I also um, just acknowledge on this slide. So if we jump right into the world report on hearing that was launched today, it's, uh, hearing care for all is the theme. Now in this presentation I will look at the current state and challenges faced in the field of ear and hearing care. And we will also summarize the findings and the recommendations of the World Report on Hearing, which outlines how these challenges in hearing care can be overcome and how hearing care for all can be a objective that we can achieve. So hearing loss is on the rise globally. Currently, 20% of the population lives with some degree of hearing loss. And it's expected that unless prompt proper actions are initiated, this proportion could rise nearly to 25% in just three decades from now. So if we translate that into numbers, there are over 1.5 billion people living with hearing loss currently, of which 430 million experience hearing loss that is of a moderate or higher degree in severity, also commonly termed as a disabling hearing loss, and they will need rehabilitation services to ensure optimal functioning. 
Of, now, this number is likely to grow to over 700 million by 2050. So the numbers are quite staggering. An important fact to note as well is that among those who have disabling hearing loss, the vast majority, approximately 80%, live in low and middle income countries of the world, where the services and resources for ear and hearing care are commonly lacking or entirely unaccessible. So while the demographic factors contribute significantly to the projected rise in hearing loss, the fact that preventable causes are on the rise is the reason why this must be considered also as an issue of imminent public health importance. Currently, over 1 billion young people are at risk of permanent avoidable hearing loss, according to this report, due to their everyday practice of listening to music at loud volumes. And at the same time, world over, hundreds of millions of children each year suffer with middle ear infections that lead to hearing loss. And such infections can both be prevented and treated. Now, among those who have disabling hearing loss, the vast majority are living in low and middle income countries of the world, where the services and resources for ear and hearing care are commonly entirely lacking. If we take one tracer or one way of measuring this as an indicator of the need for hearing aids and their actual use by those in need, we find that there is a gap of over 83% globally. So that ranges from 91% in low income countries to 74.5% in, in different income groups. So just to put that into context, that means in low income countries, less than 9% of people who should get rehabilitation services or intervention are actually accessing those services. So unaddressed hearing loss has wide ranging impacts on those affected, their families and their societies at large. It affects listening and poses challenges for everyday communication as most of us, I'm sure, are quite aware. In children especially, it hampers development of language and speech, and it's associated with delayed cognitive development in children and cognitive decline in adults. It hampers educational attainment and makes it difficult for people to find and retain jobs. And hearing loss often causes social isolation and is a cause of relationship challenges and disharmony, and it leads to feelings of loneliness, low self-esteem and depression, and even dementia. And this, of course, is all backed up by good research evidence in the uh, World Report on Hearing. So at a societal level, the lack of ear and hearing care services comes at an extremely high cost. Annually, $980 billion are lost, mainly due to loss of productivity and social isolation attributed to unaddressed hearing loss. So hearing across the life course is possible through public health action, and that's one of the important messages uh, of this World Report on Hearing. This requires strong and coordinated public health action that includes measures for prevention of hearing loss at population level, ensuring early identification of hearing loss at all ages, and providing timely and appropriate care for all those in need. Now, the next few slides explain some of these possibilities very briefly. So the first is preventative action. Many of the causes that lead to hearing loss are, in fact, preventable. In children, for instance, 60% of hearing loss is attributed to preventable causes such as rubella, low birth weight, birth complications, meningitis, ear infections, of which most of those, in fact, all of those can be prevented through available public health measures. Later in life also, protecting ears from loud sounds 
avoiding autotoxic medicines and chemicals, as well as healthy lifestyle choices, can also prevent the occurrence and the progression of hearing loss. The second action point is early identification. When hearing loss occurs, it is important to identify it at the earliest possible opportunity in order to have the most successful and optimal outcomes. Now, this can be done through systematic screening of newborns, preschool and school children, adults in high risk occupations like noise, and then also older adults. Moreover, it is possible to identify hearing loss at all stages of life, from birth till old age, and in all the settings, including community settings. We're fortunate that we live in a day and age where this is actually possible. A few decades ago, this would not have been possible. But innovative automated hearing testing has made it possible to reach each and every one. So such efforts when supported by telemedicine can ensure quality care for all. That brings us to the third point, appropriate and timely care rehabilitation. So once hearing loss is identified, it can be effectively addressed through a holistic approach that includes provision of hearing technology, such as hearing aids and implants, along with supportive rehabilitative therapy. In addition, people can also benefit through the use of sign language and lip reading. So we face challenges. I think we, we all realize this. It's a global challenge, and that's also why this world report was released. But the challenges in the field of ear and hearing care can be addressed. That's the good news. So despite the fact that solutions are available to prevent, identify and address hearing loss, the field of ear and hearing care face these challenges. On the one hand is the steadily growing number of people in need of ear and hearing care that's driven by the demographic shifts. On the other hand, the health systems do not have the capacity to provide the necessary ear and hearing care services in many instances, mainly due to a lack of human resources, a lack of policies, finances, devices, and equipment. In addition, at the level of community and among policymakers and even healthcare professionals, there is a persistent lack of awareness about hearing loss. These problems are further magnified and exacerbated by the stigma that's lined with ear and hearing problems. And that's also a key challenge that we need to address in this field. The good news is that the, re, uh, challenges, that, uh, the challenges that we face can be addressed as the World Report indicates and clearly shows. There are numerous examples in the report that are very encouraging about how these different elements can be addressed where they look at case studies and innovative uh, context-based strategies. So the way forward, uh, and they propose the way forward is to address the challenges on the path of universal coverage, countries need to adopt an integrated, people-centered approach to ear and hearing care, implemented through, through a strengthened health system so that all people can have equal access to quality care wherever they are. So I think what's been important here is this inclusion of people or person-centered care um, in these strategies. And I think in the hearing uh, world, there's been increasing appreciation for the importance of being able to provide a care that's not just mechanical, but actually takes the individual and the person in, um, into an account. So integrated people-centered ear and hearing care, um, the World Report on Hearing outlines the vision of this care, which requires the integration of prioritized ear and hearing care interventions that are delivered through a strengthened health system. Now the World Report on Hearing proposes a package of evidence-based interventions that they acronymized as hearing package of interventions 
and you can see it listed there. The first is hearing screening and intervention, ear disease prevention and management, access to technologies, rehabilitation services, improved communication, noise reduction, and then greater community engagement. So countries should determine which interventions best suit their needs by conducting an evidence-based consultative prioritization exercise and in ensuring access to these prioritized interventions and services will then require action at all levels of the health system. And this will include policy development, building human resource capacity through education and training, task sharing and task shifting, standardized guidance and practices for procuring hearing technologies, and ensuring financial and social protection, as well as setting targets and indicators for ear and hearing care that will then be monitored and reported by countries back also to the WHO. So investigating or investing in um, integrated people-centered ear and hearing care is important because it is both essential for good functioning of those at risk of or living with ear and hearing problems, but it is also cost effective. I think this is very good news. The World Report on Hearing estimates that an additional annual investment of less than $1.40 per capita can benefit 1.4 billion people over 10 years and avert 130 million disability adjusted life years and bring a return of $16 for every dollar invested over this 10 year period. So it makes sense for governments from a public health perspective to invest in ear and hearing health care. With these considerations, the World Report on Hearing presents a clear call for action. Uh, they calling upon the WHO's member states, the 194 member states that make up the World Health Assembly. Um, there's this call for action to scale up ear and hearing care and for achieving global targets of 20% relative increase in ear and hearing care coverage by 2030. So these three measurable metrics that they're calling uh, countries to is, first of all, a 20% increase in um, newborn hearing screening coverage, a 20% increase in the coverage of adults with hearing technologies, and a 20% reduction in prevalence of chronic ear diseases and unaddressed hearing loss in children. So that's, that's the main call from a public health perspective. And at that point, I'm going to complete the first section uh, where I'm sharing the main messages from the report. And let me just reiterate that you are uh, more than welcome and encouraged to actually download the full report and study it. It has a wealth of very important and valuable information. So that brings me to the second portion of this um, talk. And that's really to consider how digital innovations can support the World Report on Hearing Objectives. And here, the YearX group was founded through the work that we did at the University of Pretoria with the vision of making healthy hearing possible for everyone. And the way in which we do this, the mission that YearX has is affordable access to hearing health using digital solutions that anyone can use anywhere. So if I just highlight one of these core strategies of the World Report on Hearing, it's early identification over the life course. And the report highlights the need for innovative screening solutions. And they have a very good dis uh, uh, discussion on these newer screening solutions as well. And also the use of teleaudiology and telemedicine to assist in these early identification models. And, and I'm going to discuss this concept first and the way in which new technologies and studies that we've been involved in have actually started to address this already. So innovation to address the, the barriers that were identified. I've listed some of those barriers that were listed in the World Report on Hearing. And then on the right hand side, 
I indicate how mHealth or digital technologies can enable or address these barriers to a large extent. Firstly, um, task shifting, automation, and the use of artificial intelligence or machine learning approaches can, to a large extent, support the challenge of having limited hearing healthcare professionals around the world, especially in low and middle income countries. The expense typically uh, characterized by traditional technologies and approaches can be improved in terms of affordability. The centralized services can be adjusted because we have mobile point of care technologies that can now deliver a range of services. Quality control has traditionally in screening programs been very poor because uh, there's been no data tracking, but sensors and algorithms for rigorous quality control on mobile devices make it much more um, possible to actually do rigorous and valid uh, controls of both the environment, but also the test procedure and the test personnel. And then finally, integrated cloud data management allows us to keep track of data and to do referrals based on things like geolocation. So maybe if I just share with you some of the projects that we've run with uh, some of these innovative technologies. These have been implementation studies to evaluate um, how they work and function so that they can be scaled to other um, areas and world regions. So we have published uh, data uh, for these screening studies in young children, for over 26,000 children. Um, almost half of them have also had vision screening done with uh, the hearing screening. We've done this in five different low-income communities. Uh, the personnel that we've utilized to actually deliver these services have included 95 community health workers, uh, 25 lay health workers, and then 21 school health nurses. And the context where we've conducted these screenings have been in homes, in early childhood development centers, and in schools. So if you look at this model, just very briefly, we have a community or lay health worker conducting screening on a young child. Um, the technology allows us to map these facilities so we can actually input ahead of time where these facilities are, geolocate them. We can track or input the number of children who are there also input their names based on class lists that can be imported from the cloud-based um, data management portal so that when you get to the schools you can do the screening right away and don't waste time on capturing more information so it allows us to plan and come prepared to these sites and then using the same device uh, they can do hearing screening and visual acuity screening um, i'm going to focus on the hearing screening uh, today and then based on the test outcome and they're screened with calibrated headphones connected to these devices. Um, based on the outcome, the parent or the caregiver then automatically receives a text message uh, with the outcome of the screening. And if they fail the screen, they get a referral based on geolocation that links them to a follow-up facility in that community. And, and that follow-up facility may be a number of different types of uh, facilities. And then at these facilities, we use some of these same technologies, but the diagnostic versions, both to do threshold hearing testing, but also to do otoscopy, supported by AI classification of these tympanic membrane images, to then ensure that we can track the follow-up of these kids, and then ensure that they get the right treatments from there. So uh, these uh, studies that we've conducted to date have been published in a number of different uh, journals, and I've just listed some of these here, and I'm happy to share any of these if, if uh, any of you would like to have a look at them. Um, importantly, we've done the screening and that we've published on 26,000 children to date, but we've done screening on many, many more. So um, the studies are always a few years behind when they appear in press. So, if we look at the community screening just very briefly, uh, here's another picture of a lay health worker screening a child in an early childhood development center. So they use the year screen application, which connects to the uh, calibrated headphones. It does peer tone audiometric screening. Um, you can select the protocol. We typically use 25 decibels at one, two, and four kilohertz. 
and uh, the technology has been validated. It is a um, it's, it's a CE approved uh, audiometer. It's ac accurate. Um, it's been shown across many studies. It's very time efficient. It takes just about a minute to do the test. It's cost effective because it's off the shelf mobile technologies, and it can conduct um, significant quality control metrics um, using the technology. So, for example. It measures the environmental noise before you do the test. It does it during the test and it will flag if it's too loud in that environment to do a reliable test. And all of that gets captured to the cloud. Importantly, also, we can track the quality of the screening by the operator. So the layout workers are registered on the system. And there is, it's a false choice presentation um, that, that they do. So they don't need any audiometric skills. They just present the tone, and if the child responds, they say yes or no. But we have a randomized false presentation. So at some point, they're going to press uh, the play button, but there's going to be no sound. And that happens randomly. And if they then say yes, the child responded, we know something's wrong and there needs to be um, retraining that happens. And we track a quality index next to the name of, of the layout worker so that we can actually um, initiate these retrainings. Um, yeah, maybe I should just uh, indicate there as well. So all of this information goes into the cloud where an audiologist or a program manager can then monitor the quality and ensure that the follow-ups and the right um, next steps are action. In terms of the community screening, we developed this technology in such a way in terms of the user experience and the user design that it should be simple enough for someone who almost does not have um, uh, the literacy to be able to operate this. And in fact, your screen was selected by UNESCO and a sustainable development goal project as an example case study of digital inclusion. And, and one of the quotes in this report, and this is also a, a downloadable from, from the YearX website or UNESCO website. And one of the quotes here is that your screen's digital solution demonstrates how people with even basic literacy and digital skills can actually be participants in community health support through the use of inclusive digital solutions. So um, it, it just means it, the technology um, is simple to use, even though what happens in the back end is extremely complex in terms of the algorithms and the way the information is integrated and shared to the cloud. And maybe just uh, to take a page from the World Report on Hearing, uh, there's a discussion on these innovative screening methods and here the year screen application is showcased from one of our projects um, in the World Report, showing that these are the types of technologies that can make um, access in especially low and middle income countries more um, uh, accessible, uh, services more accessible, but it also, um, means that they can become scalable. So we can actually scale them to large scale, widespread programs. We conducted a recent study um, that was just in press or just been published in the International Journal of Audiology. It's entitled ML Hearing Screening by Non-Specialist Health Workers in Communities, where we just screened um, just over 6,800 children. And we compared the screening outcomes between a group of school health nurses who screen children and a group of community health workers who screen children. And in these analysis, we found that there was no significant effect of screener type. In other words, the outcomes of the screening was the same, whether you were a school health nurse, which is a professional, or whether you were a community health worker um, trained to operate this technology and do the same screening. And that actually uh, just corresponds to a study that was done by colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, Tess Bright um, published a paper looking at, again, lay health workers or community health workers operating the diagnostic version of the software, year test. And then they had audiologists and they also had uh, physicians and nurses also do the test. And they found that there was no difference between any of these professionals including the community health workers. So here's just the results from one of these studies, a large scale one in low income communities around Cape Town. This is kids four to six years old. 
and uh, screening just over 8,000 children in this particular study. And you can see the first screen fail rates here for hearing was 5.4%. Uh, there was a re-screen initiated immediately um, or, or for a, a second screen uh, visit. Uh, that dropped the overall referral rate to 1.5%. And of those kids who followed up, we had about a, a 50 to 60% two positive rates. So in other words, 50 to 60% of those kids actually did have a hearing problem, which is a, a very good, uh, true positive rate. You can see the average test duration, very quick, 66 seconds. And then there's also the vision component. So at the same time, we can use this technology, the same person, the same device, to also screen the sense of vision. And you can see the referral rate in this instance was very similar, 2.1%. Took slightly longer, about 90 seconds. But it means in two and a half minutes, we can screen both hearing and vision, um, which means it's a rapid screen by a minimally trained person where we've done this task shifting. Maybe just to mention here as well, of course, the instructions beforehand take an additional time. So this is just the actual test time. The instructions are oftentimes given in group um, uh, formats, but, but, but that, that certainly will um, add to the overall time. The diagnostic follow-up rate in this study was um, three in every four kids followed up at the local follow-up facility um, and a similar rate for vision. I think importantly is also the costing we did here. We did a full cost model on the cost of the transport, of the salaries, of the entire screening program, all the equipment, all the disposables. And in this program, it came to just over $5.60 to screen a child's hearing and vision for the entire service. And uh, this, this really is some of the lowest figures that have ever been shown for screening models. And we've replicated this in another study that's just been published now. And we came to a similar figure of around $6. And as we scale this to larger groups of children, that number is going to come down even more. Uh, these results were published in the World Health Organization um, Bulletin, and the, the conclusion was that mHealth supported hearing and vision screening facilitated by community health workers enable access to care in communities with inaccepted performance indicators, including the follow-up return rates, the diagnostic referral rates, and the false positive rates, and it was at a low cost. So I think that illustrates and demonstrates how these technologies can increase access and make it more affordable. So that brings me to um, the second screening uh, option I just wanted to briefly uh, showcase here. And this is a global hearing screening innovation where the screening is offered directly to consumers or patients or clients. And we use the digit to noise screening technology that we develop um, for uh, digital platforms. We launched the first offering of this in 2016 as the National Hearing Test of South Africa called the Year ZA app, which is a freely downloadable application on iOS and Android app stores. Um, what's great about this technology is that it tests uh, your hearing in less than three minutes. So it's a rapid test. We've now updated the, the test um, paradigm, we're now using an antiphasic binaural test paradigm. So we test both ears at the same time. Uh, and we know that we will pick up unilateral losses, conductive hearing losses, and bilateral sensory neural hearing losses with this approach. And it also has increased the accuracy and the sensitivity and the specificity of the test. We have also uh, been asked and tasked by the World Health Organization to use the same technology and produce the Year Who application, which was launched about two years ago for the WHO, and that has now been used in more than 190 countries around the world. And they, it's tested more than 200,000 people. I think just today it's adding tens of thousands. We also had the exciting release today of the Spanish and the Mandarin version that's been included in this Year Who application today uh, on World Hearing Day. It's also just maybe important to mention that this same test paradigm is available as a web widget uh, that can be embedded in any website that is mobile responsive, responsive. 
and this is intended for use by audiologists as a way to uh, attract more patients and provide a remote uh, screening test for potential clients and it's also used by larger organizations um, thinking for example of the 23andMe company the genomics company they have our widget on their um, site I think they've tested close to 300,000 people to date with that widget and then perhaps just to link it back to the world report on hearing there's another page from the report showcasing this digits in noise technology and someone being tested with our, our solution there um, and it discusses the digits in noise technology and its accuracy and its uses and also how it's been employed in the year who application so that brings me to the third point or the third category of, of action items identified by the World Report on Hearing and that's the third point here, appropriate and timely care and rehabilitation and that that should be prioritized and, and this is a, a brand new study that I'm going to share with you that really aligns with this goal particularly for low income regions like the African continent where we are focusing this model in particular but it certainly has value or parts of it has value for other settings as well. So this community hearing healthcare model has the aim to evaluate uh, this, a community model for end-to-end -end hearing healthcare in low and middle income countries using mHealth technologies that are operated by community health workers and here again just to acknowledge the partners um, this project is funded by the assistive tech impact fund and um, that's part of the larger assistive technology 2030 initiative and part of the uk global disability innovation hub and um, it's been awarded to yearx uh, the university of pretoria as a research partner and the Eurex Foundation is the implementation and training partner for this project. So as I start off explaining this model, and, and this is where I will end off with this model, um, let me just take one more page from the World Report on Hearing. This is an important strategy that I highlight um, to make use of task shifting so that Skills, say, skills and traditional services that were provided by professionals like um, ear care um, physicians or audiologists can be shifted certain services to be operated by community health and lay health workers much as I've demonstrated to you earlier and they show this potential across the continuum here on this um, figure from screening right through to support and rehabilitation and this red is the potential roles that these other health professionals can um, uh, can fulfill and the gray parts are the traditional roles um, that have been fulfilled by professionals to deliver these services but if you remember correctly from the world report there's a massive shortage of human resources in a continent like Africa there's approximately one audiologist to every million people in Africa so that's just traditional models are not going to deliver the services or the care that's required. So this model really relies on the task shifting idea from this world report on hearing. So the model has these five steps. The community health workers or lay health workers deliver this care in communities and it's supported by mHealth technologies. And then there's a hearing care professional or an audiologist that can support this service remotely um, by monitoring, tracking and doing the training. So in this instance, we have the detection of hearing loss. So it may be self-report, it may be uh, some kind of screening. Then there's a diagnostic component where the, all the diagnostics happen off a mobile device that a community health worker has with some additional peripherals that connect to that mobile device. And I'll share a little bit more around that in a moment. And then once they've done the testing from this device, um, it's actually done through the hearing aids, it's an in-situ hearing test, they can immediately from the mobile phone program those hearing aids for that individual to experience what hearing aids can do for their ability to hear. Um, and then if they opt to take up the treatment, they can receive a personalized the hearing aids um, right there and then and then support can be provided in the community by these layout workers through different modes including um, mHealth um, text messaging support modes 
So if we just look at the kind of basic uh, test technology for this model, we're using low cost, high quality hearing aids that are digitally um, integrated with a 16 channel wide dynamic range compression, Bluetooth, adaptive directionality and noise reduction. It can fit a mild to severe hearing loss range. So we take a 80% um, you know, heat rate. So we can, we can probably support 80% of adult hearing losses with this model. Um, it's integrated into this mobile platform and the smartphone based in situ peer tone audiometry test is used in this, in, in this case. And it's an automated self test that's been validated. And then the smartphone hearing aid fitting that happens through the Bluetooth connection is according to prescriptive targets, the NAL NL2 method. And then of course the device also does data logging so we can track the usage of these individuals. So the detection, which is the first step, maybe due to well maybe through several modes could be community-based screenings conducted by mobile technologies it could be at primary healthcare clinics or in pharmacies where they use some of these technologies or it could be self-report community networks and and it depending on the context it could be a combination of these as well in terms of the diagnostic component so it uses validated Bluetooth in situ hearing testing through these digital hearing aids. And what we do is uh, there's a new disposable dome that's put onto these hearing aids. When they're put onto the individual's ears, they might be at their home or in a clinic. Um, and then on top of those hearing aids, they put Peltor earmuffs. And these Peltor earmuffs provide attenuation in addition to the hearing aids that is similar to a single world sound booth. And then from the mobile phone, a hearing test can be conducted through the hearing aids in the ear canal. And we can typically test from 250 to 8,000 hertz. Um, and then there's the innovative triaging test battery that's built into this to determine the configuration and the degree of the hearing loss and to identify risks of conductive hearing loss and ear disease. And then to screen for a potential asymmetric hearing loss that may require further referral onto clinics and audiological assessments at hospital settings if there are this available in these countries. So here's just an example of a pilot we conducted with a number of elderly persons in their homes. Um, it was conducted by the community health workers who were trying to operate this. Here you can see they're putting on the hearing aids on the individual's ears. And then they have the Peltor earmuffs covering those hearing aids. And then the community health worker is giving them instructions on to press the button when they hear a sound. They run through the hearing test and then the results are displayed here in this instance. And we've done um, initial studies on the validity and the accuracy of this in situ audiometry. And here you can see the correlation between the hearing uh, aid test thresholds on the Y axis and the peer tone audiometry thresholds on the X axis. And you can see it's it's a 0.95 um, correlation, which is almost a perfect correlation. So very good correspondence between these test methods. And then once they've done the hearing test, they connect a, a ear scope otoscope, which is a pen-like otoscope, and they do a, a, a otoscopic examination. So they can take an image of the ear canal and the eardrum if it's visible. And then based on the AI algorithm, it can automatically indicate whether it's normal, has a wax obstruction, or it has some kind of other abnormality that requires a referral for a medical assessment. Um, so this way we can triage um, patients who have permanent sensory neural hearing losses, so adult patients, of course, and they can be treated with hearing aids through this model. But those who are identified with conductive hearing loss, uh, ear disease or wax um, suspicion, they need to be referred onwards for further assessments uh, by um, medical practitioners or audiological centers that are usually in low income countries, you know, available only at, at tertiary hospitals in urban settings. And then once they've done this testing, if, if someone does have sensory neural hearing loss, that fits into the category that the hearing aids can support. The community health worker can, by the press of a button, program these hearing aids according to their hearing thresholds. 
And here's just an example of a 90 year old um, uh, community member who we fitted with these hearing aids. And this was the first time she had hearing aids um, and she's had a significant hearing loss for over 20 years. And her first words were, it is as if, as if I'm able to see and everything is clear. I think that demonstrates the power of being able to do something right there and then. So they can actually experience the benefit and that can encourage other members in the family also to support them in terms of um, acquiring the hearing aids and ensuring that they regularly get the batteries and the support that they require to, to use these hearing aids. So, of course, we know it's not just about fitting hearing aids. There's all kinds of hand-holding and support and troubleshooting that needs to happen. So we've also developed a community-based support program that trains these community health workers to provide support in basic aspects. Part of this is an mHealth contact program where messages are sent to these individuals once they get the hearing aids in the first week on a daily basis. And it helps them to acclimatize and to look after their hearing aids and their voice notes included and infographics. And, um, and then if it's necessary, the community health worker can also escalate queries or troubleshooting to a program manager, which, which in all likelihood would be an audiologist, who can then provide assistance and support remotely. And I've taken this um, figure from a GSMA report entitled the Understanding the Mobile Disability Gap. And I think the interesting thing here is that it looked at persons with different types of disabilities and their use of mobile phones and smartphones in particular. And in this study, we're interested in Kenya because this is where we're aiming to roll this uh, initial evaluation program out later this year. But in Kenya, you can see persons with hearing impairment have a 59% penetration of smartphones, so ownership. So people with hearing loss seem to rely on these devices even more than other persons and obviously for understandable reasons. Um, and then we're looking with our partners at innovative models to make these uh, services sustainable. So mobile money um, is, is a way in which a subscription-based model could work where people can you know, subscribe from their mobile phones and have a very low cost subscription over a certain period of time that may be an all-inclusive kind of model. We're looking at ways to make it sustainable so that we can roll it out in these uh, community settings. So in Kenya, once again, if you look at the mobile money account ownership by mobile users with and without disabilities, those who have difficulty hearing are actually the group with the highest penetration of mobile money. So in other words, the highest use of mobile money is amongst people with hearing problems. So some of the potential uh, avenues we're looking at is also to work with uh, community-based solar power providers who are already providing services and to just add on a hearing care package as a potential service. And there's all kinds of other models that we're also looking at um, at this stage. It's an exploration stage, but there's lots of innovative ways in which it can be um, both affordable, sustainable and scalable. So to conclude, um, smart digital hearing health tech uh, is an important strategy as part of the priorities for the world report on hearing. Digital inclusion and task shifting for layout workers can be um, facilitated. Automated testing and interpretation is a, is a major advantage of these technologies. The fact that we can have assisted diagnosis and triage using these technologies at points of care in communities certainly make the decentralization and the mobility of these models much more attractive. And the fact that we can have community test and fit models of care um, uh, assures greater efficiency and um, decentralization of co comprehensive community based care uh, fits into the strategy of task shifting. And, and delivering services in primary healthcare settings. And then of course, because these technologies are connected to the cloud and can sync asynchronously or in real time, it allows for remote surveillance, management and support to be conducted by program managers in, in, in other remote settings. And then finally, as I mentioned, 
it has the potential to really provide affordable and scalable solutions in settings where currently there are no existing hearing healthcare services available. So at that point, thank you for your attention and for uh, spending this time with us on this webinar. I'm going to stop the presentation at this point. I think we have four minutes left. If there are any questions, feel free to post those in the questions tab and then I would be happy to see if I can respond to some of those. Trying to look through some of these uh, questions. It looks like there's quite a number of them. Let me let me start. Um, so, so there's a question here about asymmetrical losses and retrocochlear losses. So there's obviously um, red flag questions that we ask. There's the CEDRA consumer-based um, uh, risk assessment tool that's been validated that we include in these assessments. We also check for asymmetry between the left and the right ear. So there are standard um, uh, algorithms that if it exceeds a certain uh, ratio, that red flags someone immediately and then they have to be referred for further um, assessments. And of course, there's also the, um, the view from the otoscope that helps us with ear disease. And then we've developed during COVID-19 an algorithm that we call a risk uh, conductive hearing loss risk algorithm. It's just been published as well, where we utilize both the digits in noise test. So they also do a digits in noise test in this community-based program and the peer tone uh, thresholds, air conduction. We use the low uh, frequency air conduction thresholds and the digits in noise test in a, a, a logistic regression algorithm that then can differentiate hearing loss into sensory neural and conductive hearing loss with an accuracy of about 94%. And we also employ that algorithm in this community-based model. So we have a number of different strategies that all kind of cross-check each other so that we can be very reason, well, reasonably sure um, that, that we can identify these risks. And again, I, I need to reiterate, this is, this is intended for, for settings where other services are not available at all, right? Uh, so let me just... Uh, see what other um, question was there. There's some in encouragement about the work. Uh, in the context of COVID-19, how do we ensure safe and decentralized service provision? So we have um, done a lot of this work before COVID. We've actually stopped for a long period of time. We've just resumed and we're obviously taking, making sure that we're applying all the relevant um, personal PPE uh, approaches and protocols, so very strict protocols in place and informed consent for individuals if they are willing to continue with the, the service. Uh, there's another question here about wider screening. Countries need to adopt training community health workers on basic screening audiometry for case identification. Um, yes, and I agree. I think that's just a statement. Challenges, okay. So here's a comment um, that asks, or a question, hearing healthcare has become a public health concern. The fundamental of public health is prevention. How do we change our service provision to be more preventative driven than rehabilitative care? And yes, I think that's one of the messages from the World Report is that prevention is the primary strategy, of course, and prevention in, entails both preventing hearing loss from occurring, but also preventing hearing loss from progressing once it's there, and also preventing hearing loss from, from affecting individuals even more without the re relevant rehabilitation services. So yes, it's, it's always, uh, it's never a, a either or, it's always, you know, you have to have both of those strategies. So on a public health advocacy level, there's definitely important strategies where we need to work with government, national departments of health, and, and, and the WHO has some excellent resources and strategies that they've also um, put forward in that regard. And then I think there's just another uh, good comment there, but not a specific uh, question. 
Um, there's a question here about where, why is the app and services used in the US in areas where diagnostic services are available? So I'm, I'm not exactly sure what application is referred to there. Certainly some of these technologies to make um, testing available outside of sound booths have been used during COVID-19. So there is a self-test kit that audiologists have used uh, in the US in particular uh, that Eurex has developed. Um, to provide services at home. So you can send a tablet with a calibrated pair of headphones to do this, some of this testing at home or counter side testing so that they don't have to go into the booth or there's even be, been curbside assessment. So it's almost like a drive through where they get the equipment in the car, do the testing and then further decisions can be done through a tele, tele consultation of sorts. Um, and then there's a question by Andrew Parker, as a hearing impaired individual, how can I assist Eurex with spreading their message and advocating for the heart of hearing? Uh, thank you for that uh, comment, Andrew. I, I mean, I think uh, th there's always advocacy needed and there's a, there's a World Hearing Forum where they actually encourage people, you know, who are actually part of the, uh, the community of persons who have hearing difficulties to participate. So I think that's a good avenue. Um, in terms of uh, direct, uh, you know, inputs into Eurex, I think uh, any engagements with Eurex are always welcome. So if, if you want to connect with persons there, please feel free to do that. We'd love to hear from you and also some of your ideas on what the actual needs are that you've experienced as, as, as someone, um, you know, living with hearing loss. Thank you, Kim Cavett, uh, someone from the US uh, logging in as well. Uh, thank you for those encouraging words. Um, I think it's an exciting time in the hearing health uh, industry. There's lots of potential and with the world report, there's also now the momentum and the advocacy tools to really get governments and national departments of health on board. And, and that may be a strategy for everyone who's interested in hearing healthcare, whether you're a professional or a person living with hearing loss, or someone who's involved in policy, is this report is really a tool to advocate for the importance of ear and hearing care services. And, 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 the, and the technologies are becoming increasingly enabling, but we also need the goodwill and the motivation and, and, and the, um, the backing of uh, policymakers and governments and departments of health. So, so that's something that takes hard work, lots of discussions, networking, and it's something that everyone can engage in. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to stop there. I see it's just six o'clock now. Um, if there are any other questions, feel free to contact me on um, email or um, any of the other platforms. I'd be happy to engage with you or send any of these resources or published papers through to you if you want to have a closer look. Um, I trust you'll enjoy the rest or the remaining part of your World Hearing Day and uh, happy hearing to all of you.